Welcome to My Journey of Faith, hosted by Cynthia McCutcheon, wife, mother, Bible teacher, and speaker. A gathering place for Christian women to proclaim the love of Christ by sharing compelling life stories to encourage, inspire, and equip women on their personal journeys of faith. For the next 30 minutes, please join us on this journey. Here's your host, Cynthia McCutcheon. Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you today to My Journey of Faith. You know, I've been studying um, a little bit. Even today, God just showed me about how much we need our rest, our time that God has given us to set back and to pull away. Um, there are so many times, even when the uh, Egyptian, I mean, whenever the Israelites were coming away from the Egyptians, that's when he introduced the Sabbath. And he, I'm sure they were like, excuse me, what? Because the whole thing knew was work, especially 400 years making bricks and all of that. But God designs that for us, and he wants us to rest in him. And that's where we're going today with my guest. My guest is Vicki Henderson. She was, um, she's an obstetrician and gynecology um, doctor in Russellville, Arkansas. She's been that for 20 years, delivering over 5,000 babies. She was an exercise enthusiast, an avid cyclist, until she was diagnosed with a neuromuscular muscular disease in June 2014. God clearly showed her from the beginning that he was going to give her a year of Sabbath rest, her personal jubilee. Working after she's currently working on a book de detailing how God is giving her a fulfilled life rather than a filled life. She has been married to her husband Ken for 31 years. He serves as a re legislator at the state representative. Um, she has three children, Haley, 25, Braden, 21, and Brianna, 19. Hi, Vicki. How are you? I'm good. Great. So God called you on a journey that you probably had no clue and was not prepared for, but one that you look back on and you're so blessed to see, right? I am. He really showed his hand to be so evident from the very beginning. That is amazing. Now, I read a, I read a, a devotional that you wrote recently and that you um, talked about being ready, getting all ready for a cycling event, and then God changed the course. So why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Well, for about three or four months, I had been planning for my daughter and two of my cycling buddies and myself to ride the Katy Trail. And the Katy Trail is a Rails to Trails project that goes across the state of Missouri, and it's 257 miles. So we were going to spend five days on the trail, just us and the bikes. And the day before we were supposed to leave, I had myasthenia gravis, which generalized to my entire body. And I wound up in the emergency room and transported to a tertiary hospital where I stayed for five days. Oh, my. Oh, my. Now, was this expected? Did it have any kind of warning? or? What I have is myasthenia gravis, and it started in my eyes in early May. And I knew that the statistics were it progressed the rest of your body 85% of the time. So I did have a warning, but at the time it progressed the rest of my body, I actually did two C-sections that morning. I was still going in high gear like I've done my whole entire life. Oh, wow. Goodness. So how did you cope with that? How did you grasp, get things around it and, and say, okay, five days, I'm going to, instead of me being the doctor, I'm the patient. Right. And I permanently transitioned. I'm completely disabled now, and I've been a patient ever since, and I've been in the hospital multiple times. In fact, I have to go in every three weeks for a treatment now. And what I had done is since I knew this was in my eyes and I was concerned about my strength, I wrote out scriptures on index cards, which is a habit I've had for a long time. They're all over my house. They're in drawers. They're in pockets. I have tattered index cards everywhere. My son's senior year of high school, I wrote out one for him every single day, and he kept them. And so that's really special to me. And I decided that these women could pray these scriptures over me every day. And so I wrote one that pertained to strength for each day, such as Psalm 29, 11, the Lord gives his people strength. And so I intended for my, my buddies and my daughter to pray those over me. 
But instead, I had a verse for every day I was in the hospital. And it was in my head. I had it memorized. And it sustained me because I was too weak to even hold a Bible or a book or anything. I couldn't even use my arms. But okay. I was able to meditate on those scriptures that strength. Okay, so you had originally written these scriptures out for your bike ride. Yes. And then they came into play. Oh, what the timing of God is. How awesome. I was supposed to be on the trail for five days, and those same exact five calendar days I was in the hospital. Oh, my. Wow. So you had your own personal copies of God's Word that you had that He had given you for a time that you thought was for something else, but He had given you for those specific days. Exactly. What an amazing journey. Now, tell us a little bit about... Um, some of the other things that God was maybe teaching you through that time. I mean, five days to go from full go, I'm sure, to screeching halt. <laughs> That's exactly the way I describe it, screeching halt. I've always lived in perpetual overdrive, and I have really ignored the command to rest. Mm -hmm. When I turned 49, I ran across the concept of Jubilee in the book of Leviticus. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was very intriguing, and I was turning 49. It was unclear to me if the Jubilee was in the 49th or the 50th year, because it's 7 times 7. It's a Sabbath of Sabbath. But I began to study it, and I spent about three or four months studying it and taking notes. And, and to be quite honest with you, I really didn't get anything out of it. And so I just put my notes away, and I've never been able to locate them again, and I really didn't even think about it again. And that was when I turned 49. I got sick shortly before my 50th birthday, and I was... I was in town one day, going to the post office, and I felt like the Lord said to me, this is part of the Jubilee. And I said, well, that's great, but I've really got a lot going on right now. Because <laughs> <laughs> it didn't mean anything to me. I didn't even know what that meant. When I had studied it, I really didn't understand what it meant. And so that very same night, I went and met with some people that prayed over me, and they gave me something about the Jubilee. Now, and I just kind of held my breath, and I said, and, and they said, does that mean something to you? And I said, it sure does. And they said, what? And I said, I don't know. But the Lord said to me this afternoon, this is part of the Jubilee. So I went home and I read the 25th chapter of Leviticus again. And what it says is that you will consecrate the 50th year. And I was mm -hmm. just getting ready to turn 50. And it will be a year of complete rest for the land, a Sabbath year of rest. And I just felt like at that time, the Lord was telling me, don't fight this. You're going to rest for a year, and it's my plan for you. Oh, wow. Wow. So the journey through a year of rest, I mean, not to fight it. I can understand that, accepting that. But still, you you were so busy. How, how did you embrace it? Maybe not fight it, it but embrace it. It was really a supernatural thing. I had a complete peace and a complete joy about not working from the beginning. And the Lord would wake me up. Of course, I was on a lot of steroids, and so I couldn't sleep. But I'd wake up very, very early in the morning, and I would, I would go to a devotional book, or I'd go to my Bible, or whatever. And then all throughout the day, that same verse would come up over and over and over. Mm -hmm. The Lord just affirmed and confirmed. You know, if, if I was studying one scripture, somebody would text me that same scripture that afternoon. Wow. And it's like the Lord just kept showing me, I'm in this, I'm in this, and I'm with you, and I'm going to provide for you. And it was just a joy that I, I can hardly describe. So how do you share that with others? Because I'm sure there was a step-by-step -step process. Maybe there was some um, confusion at times or, you know, because a year of rest. I mean, sometimes a week is hard. <laughs> sometimes a weekend is hard. But a year, and what were the things that God really maybe was wanting to show you, maybe to uh, affirm to you, to point out and teach you? Well, I did a lot of journaling during those early morning hours before any was, anyone else was up. And I just, I just wrote pages and pages in my journal. And I think the Lord needed to deal with some heart issues. I had some unforgiveness that I had to let go of. I had, it was a season of repentance in a lot of ways. I had to really seek the Lord for where I had gotten into habits of sin that didn't feel like sin anymore. And I had to go back and just let the Lord examine me. And it wasn't a painful time. It was a, it was a sweet time of, of just repentance and restoration 
And I just journaled those thoughts for about six months. And then as I began to get stronger, I started writing. And that's, and that's W-R-I-T-I-N-G instead of riding in my bicycle. <laughs> and I went back and read some of my old journals, and I, I found this common theme of this desire I had to write. I had had it since I was a little girl. And I felt like God was in his way giving me the true desire of my heart. Mm-hmm. that I had always been right. So I started writing a blog at the end of December, and I did that twice a week, and then I started writing a book so that I could share all of the remarkable things that the Lord did in my life during that year. Exactly, exactly. So God gave you a wonderful life prior to this, and I'm sure the joy and, and all of that, especially seeing over 5,000 babies come into the world, <laughs> I'm sure that's like a miracle upon miracle upon miracle. And it never got old. I loved it. I can imagine. I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> and then he takes you on a rest, but now he's got you on a whole different fork in the road, a whole different journey that's just as beautiful. That's exactly the way I feel. And I also feel like the 20 years I spent sewing into the lives of women and knowing women's hearts mm. actually prepared me. For the writing that I'm doing now. Oh, I can imagine. I can imagine. So on your your quest with God, His taking you through this journey, what are some of the things that you've been able to maybe share with women? Um, probably you're not going through anything similar to what you've done, but so many times we glean from what we've gone through that we can share with others. What are some things that God is laying on your heart to share with them? I think the first thing is just finding blessing in adversity, finding purpose. And the title of my blog is My Right Side of Life, because right after I got sick was my birthday, and my pastor sent me a little note, and he said, I know your life has been turned upside down. And I thought, you know, In a lot of ways, my life has been turned right side up. And so I want to encourage other people to not be overwhelmed when circumstances are totally the opposite of what I would have wanted. I would have never chosen this journey. But I also wouldn't trade it. And I want people to look for the blessings. When life seems to turn upside down, look for what God's really trying to do. And don't miss the sweetness of it all. That is so true because so many times we do, we get so bogged down and we can't um, get those blinders off of our eyes that we can see the blessings. But there are so many blessings hidden in every part of our lives, even the ones that turn us upside down. So in your book, and I know you've been doing a little bit of speaking and sharing, right? Yes. Um, So what are some um, other ways that maybe, what if a woman's saying, you know, my life has been turned upside down. I can see the blessings, but I'm still stuck. What can we share with them? Well, I think we all get to that place. And and I think think it helps to see someone else that's going through a similar journey. You know, people Mm -hmm. whose lives have been turned upside down by chronic illness, I've certainly been able to relate to those women. I also have a beautiful view from my front porch, and I have been so blessed to have so many friends, old friends, as well as many, many new friends that would come and actually visit me physically on my porch, Mm -hmm. and that's been a real opportunity to, to continue counseling women, which is what I did so much for 20 years, to continue that one on one counseling, just to invite people to come and sit on the porch with me. I love that. That's wonderful. Um... There's something about just that time of sitting with someone and sharing and even around nature and the beautiful views that are around us that that can, there can be healing. There can be um, ways that we refocus and we can re-see things. So how did your family accept your um, sabbatical? Were that, was that hard for them? Mom, mom was totally... One way, and now she's different. I mean, how did that take a stress on your family, or how did they pull together with you? Everyone responds differently. Everyone responds differently. And my son is actually the one that encouraged me to write the book because he was a little bit 
discouraged by all that had happened because he just couldn't understand how God would allow something like this to take away a career that I loved and the activities that I loved and really my ability to do anything. I could not drive a car for mm. six months. I could not wear boots because they were too heavy. I couldn't walk across my house. I couldn't leave my house at times. I couldn't even sit up. And he was very discouraged. And I said, I'm going to tell you some of the things that the Lord has done. And I shared some of the things I've shared with you as well as some other things. And he said, Mom, people need to hear about this. Mm. And so he was just encouraged by my personal story. But I think it's a process. And in many ways, it's like the grief process. You know, we start out going through denial. Oh, this is not an incurable disease. It is an incurable disease. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and then we start out with, you know, the next step is anger. And mm -hmm. I think that we kind of went through that sometimes at the same time and sometimes at different times. And everybody had to process it differently. And, and it's definitely a challenge. Oh, I imagine. I imagine. Um, but just hearing the voice, your voice, and the smile in your voice, I would think that you were probably on the encouraging end <laughs> more than they were. <laughs> That's true. That's very true. <laughs> So how did you get to the point where you saw that this is a fulfilled life? Well, when I started doing my blog and just hearing from so many people who were going through circumstances that really humbled me because their circumstances were so much worse than mine. But they just continued to tell me, you encouraged me so much. You helped me through this time in my life so much. And that was so rewarding for me. The other thing is I had been on three mission trips to China and I had particularly connected with a young girl who's now 28 years old and I reconnected with her through this and we we talk often she is still not a believer but I hope I hope she will be soon but um, she actually said she heard my story and she actually called me and she said now that I hear the happiness in your voice I'm starting to believe wow. and so I'm very encouraged that it's part of the Lord's purpose for me to have this illness to bring her to a saving faith in him. I think that's key is when we get to the point where we can see the struggles or the um, the adversities, just the different paths that God has us walking down that it's part of his purpose. It's part of his plan. And it was a little awkward at first because, you know, I had this promise from the Lord that this complete rest was going to last for a year. And so many people were like, oh, I just know you're going to be better. You're going to get stronger and stronger every day. And you know, I'm praying for you. I'm praying the Lord's going to heal you. And and I, I just didn't feel released to even ask the Lord for healing until that year was up. Oh. And I believed that at the end of that year that that I would, you know, that I would be healed or, you know, that I would, that that year of rest would at least be over. And I had three dates picked out. The June 25th is when I went into the hospital. So that would be the end of the year of, of me being diagnosed. July 10th was a significant date out of Leviticus, and some significant things happened. So I had that day picked out. And then August 25th was my birthday. And I thought on one of those three days that the Jubilee would come to an end. And so what I did is I planned a bicycle ride for July the 10th. And it was the same group that was supposed to go on the Katy Trail, and, and we planned to ride seven miles. And we went down to the state park, and my dad blew in a ram's horn, and my mother read out of my grandfather's Bible. And we got on those bicycles, and we rode seven miles, oh, wow. which was a miracle because I had not physically done anything in a year. I mean, I was using a handicap hang tag. I couldn't even park and walk into a grocery store. And then I suddenly got better. I actually got better on June 15th. And I wondered why, because that was not one of the three days that I thought would signify the end. But my children reminded me that I had dropped a plate about 10 days before I went in the hospital. And so it probably was a year to the hour, certainly to the day, but probably it was a year to the hour that I got better. And it was at a time when I really wasn't expecting it. Oh, wow. Wow. So you've said it's an incurable disease, but you're seeing progress? I'm seeing a lot of progress, and it's typical for the disease to be the worst the first year, but I don't think you can argue with the timing of it being to the hour. No, not at all. That, I've had a surgery. I had a robotic thymectomy, um, which is a, you have a gland that's underneath your breastbone on top of your heart, and they think that removing that might help, and it takes 6 to 12 months for that to work. So I had that done a year ago, and I take 
I've taken a lot of steroids, and I take another drug every three and a half to four hours, and then I'm on an immunosuppressant, and I go into the hospital every three weeks and get IVIG, which is immune globulin. Hmm. And I just continue to get stronger and stronger. Oh, that is amazing. Now, whenever you took this bike ride, was I know it had to be hard. You hadn't done any physical exertion for a year. But was the smile on your face the whole seven <laughs> miles? <laughs> I wish you could have seen my mother. <laughs> she was, we made three laps around the state park, and she stood and just cried the uh -huh. whole time. Now, my daughter was riding with me, and she was behind me as if she were going to catch me if I fell. <laughs> okay. But it was quite a celebration. Oh, I imagine. I imagine. So God has you on just an awesome path of sharing what his purpose is and even through um, what a testimony of sharing about a Sabbath, the time to take the rest and to reflect and restore to him. That is just amazing. It so, is, and I think there's such a need in our society. You know, I feel like I've even instilled in my children, I was the master of efficiency. I was the queen of multitasking. And I feel like I've instilled that in my children to, you know, be high energy and high achievers and and driven and hardworking. And those are good things, but I don't think we can ignore that command to rest. Exactly. That is so true because there is so much in um, sitting back and letting God refill us. Because even Jesus did it. He did it throughout his time here on earth, took that rest to be with the Father. Yes. So what if we were to sit here and we were to, I was to give you uh, just a few minutes to encourage women just to say a few words and maybe someone that's um, across the table from us, how would you encourage her? How, what would you give her that would um, instill God's love in his time for her? For me, I think one of the most important things is to be in God's word in a level digging in and, and those index cards, that's such a simple thing to do. You can do a Google search and find a verse for whatever situation you're dealing with and write that down on a sticky note, write it down on an index card and carry that with you at all times because that is the sword of the spirit. That is your weapon. Mm -hmm. That's how you fight when you're attacked. And if you are unarmed, you are going to be harmed. And I just would encourage women to arm themselves with the word of God and let that Fill your heart and mind and soul so that you have that when you need it. I love that. And I think it's very timely that we're talking about this with the new movie and the book um, and the studies with Priscilla Shire coming out, The War Room, and her Armor of God study, and even the book Fervent. Um, how much we need that prayer time and to be those warriors with, uh, for God in prayer and through Scripture. Well, Vicki, I want to thank you so much for being on the show today. You have been just a joy to, to hear your story and to share it with the ladies uh, throughout um, our listening audience. It has just been amazing. So first I want to do is I want to uh, let the ladies know where to find your blog. If you could give them the address, please. It's www.myupsiderightlife. Com. I love that. I love that. I think it's a great um, picture of what life can sometimes happen to. So thank you so much for being on this show. Thank you. And for those of you listening, I want to encourage you to dig into God's Word. Let Him show you the blessings throughout all the journeys that you're going through. Um, encourage. I want to also encourage you to share your story. Um, thank you for joining us on My Journey of Faith, and please look for us on Facebook at My Journey of Faith Radio and our website, MyJourneyOfFaith.com. So until next week, be blessed and remember, share your own personal story with your, your sphere of influence. They will be blessed, and so will you. Till next week, bye-bye.